I love books, and to me, reading is one of the most valuable ways to learn the foundations to master any skill. But learning new things does not come without its pitfalls. If you're like me, you might have a bad habit with reading. Like a chain smoker, you start up the next book the minute that you finish reading the last one. In this video, I want to talk about some of the strategies that I am using to become a better reader. This is meant to be for learning new skills and reading nonfiction specifically. By all means, what you can do to get the most enjoyment out of the books that you're reading for leisure, you should do. In this video, we're going to talk about designing your lifelong learning plan. We're then going to go into the decision making strategy on what topic will help you grow the most. I want to talk about this idea of reading the five books of stupid. And we'll touch on the ROI of reading books compared to other forms of learning. Mastery then range is the path forward on the lifelong learning journey. We want to have enough skill and range to support our core subject of expertise. This is referred to as T-shaped learning. People expect you to have mastery and know a lot about one particular area that you're skilled at but also to know a lot of little things in supporting areas. And this is especially common in the health and fitness realm where clients are looking for a one-stop shop in the form of their health coaches. Using the example of health coaches in ultra competitive spheres like this, where there are a ton of health coaches available, if you are a coach who doesn't also know about nutrition, stress management, sleep, how to market yourself, social media, leadership, all of that, your clients will find somebody else who does know it all. But until you also know what your area of expertise is, like maybe specifically working with hockey players and training them to turn pro, you won't have a successful niche where clients can find you either. So most of us know what subject we want to master. Either it's going to be what we've gone to school for or we have a deep passion and curiosity to learn everything we possibly can about it. So it may not be necessarily your career path. This opens up the possibility to be a primary flow activity. If you don't already know which direction of mastery you're heading in, I'll link to a couple of videos where I've talked about things like finding your core personal philosophy so that you can go and explore that a bit further. I also talked about this more in a Finding Flow newsletter at the start of this year with some guiding questions to help you figure out what that path is for yourself. So I will link that below as well. Once you know what this area of mastery for you is and you've built up a foundation of skills there, the question is, what should you learn about next? You've already got some specialty training or you've really dug in and learned a lot about that subject. You probably love reading about your area of expertise and could talk about it for hours on end if anybody asks about it, but that's not what's holding you back anymore. We want to then look at running what's called an educational tournament. Once you go deep, you then go wide. In the book Change Maker, Dr. John Berardi writes about the importance of the T-shaped learning approach and how to run what he calls an educational tournament to develop your breadth of knowledge once you've established that depth. Prioritize the low-hanging fruit by doing what is known as a limiting factor analysis to ask yourself what is holding you back. This should be the determining factor for your educational tournament. So you're going to pair up all the different domains that you're working on as if they were sports teams in a playoff bracket and eliminate each pair until only one subject remains. You know, as a lover of books and somebody who will read just about anything I can get my hands on, I find this to be a bit of a ruthless approach to learning. But if you seriously value making progress, this will help you so much more than just jumping from one book to the next without any sense being made on why you're reading it other than you heard it as a podcast recommendation or a friend told you to read this book. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of this type of reading for leisure. 
and to explore curiosity. But the intention behind the educational tournament is to focus on that one thing that's holding you back the most to leap ahead in your skill development and to set yourself apart from other experts. Now, maybe you're not quite ready to develop this breadth of knowledge. What if you're just starting out on mastering a subject or going deep on a new subject that you're learning about? That's where this next method ties in, which is going deeper with the five books of stupid. As a career author, Stephen Kotler is very passionate about books. And as someone driven to keep growing, and find more flow, you should be too. Kotler has ghostwritten some best-selling books in addition to his own bestsellers on flow and peak performance. This requires him to not just have his own perspective and knowledge, but to understand deeply the new subjects that he's exploring with an author who may be an expert in a completely different domain. That's why he likes to follow this approach that he calls the five books of stupid. And he talks about this idea in one of my favorite books on peak performance and flow, which is The Art of Impossible. And in the section particularly on learning and how to enhance your ability to learn, he talks about this five books of stupid approach. You're going to pick five books based on the following criteria and read them without judgment. You want to become familiar first with the terminology that's used in the field. So book one is going to be the most popular bestseller in the category. Base book one on reviews and bestseller lists, but it's almost always not going to be the most recent book in the category. Now book two is going to be another popular seller but a little more technical than book one. You'll usually find this in the bibliography of well-written bestsellers. Book three is then going to be a semi-technical book on the subject. And book four is going to be something that is a hard book. It's not going to be as fun to read. It'll be very technical on the subject. Often it's going to look and read more like a textbook than a standard book would. In book five, whenever possible, find a book that talks more about the future of the subject that you're reading on. You want to open the loops and questions about what's next or where there are gaps in the knowledge on the subject. Now, Stephen Kotler states that a lot of learning comes down to pattern recognition. The important thing is to take note of the stuff you find curious rather than doing this five books of stupid approach for memorizing facts that you can look up anytime just by opening a book and flipping to a page. Curiosity is going to lead you down the path to creativity and finding your unique perspectives and insights in this field. This approach is used not just to understand the terminology and map out a representation of this subject in your web of knowledge, it's also used so that you can take your understanding and curiosity to then interview experts in the field for more of a mentorship approach to learning, which is also something that John Berardi values very deeply as a learning approach and talks about in Changemaker. And this also brings up an important debate on the ROI of reading and why should we read books? Because one of the outstanding questions about the focus on books for learning is this is an area where John Berardi and Stephen Kotler are at odds on what's the best way to learn. Stephen says that books provide way more details per page than any other form of learning. You know, a blog or newsletter, for example, is about three days of work when the author takes the effort seriously. A keynote presentation or podcast that you hear from the author as they go around promoting their new book may take a month to prepare to cover the main talking points of the book. But these forms of learning are going to miss out on many of the details packed into the pages of a book. And by comparison, the years that it takes for an author to write a book that is so good that it can hold its ground as a reputable source and bestseller in any category increases that ROI. Now, when John's talking about the different ways to learn in Changemaker 
and how to build this educational tournament and figure out where to develop skills, he argues that anybody can write a book and publish it on Amazon. So there's zero credibility required to be a published author. So it's better to go straight to the source, learn from high cost courses and certifications under governing bodies to hold it to that higher standard. And for Steven, the books themselves aren't the wellspring of knowledge. So much as generating a source for creativity and curiosity so that you can find the gaps and explore and pick out where different thought leaders in the field disagree. This is an important consideration and debate on what is the best way to learn. I love books and the written medium matters to me as one of the best ways that I can think and process information. If you're just starting out on your learning journey, I can understand the concern that Dr. Berardi has for credibility, but once you've built up your depth in a subject, you get much better at picking up on what might not be accurate. Whether you've gone to university or just learned deeply about the topic, you'll get that sense of when to question the validity of sources. And a bonus tip to learn how to master any subject through reading is to first learn how to find more flow while reading books, which you can learn about in this next video here.